Vamos a tener el placer de tener con nosotros a la profesora Kimberly Schoner de la University of British Columbia, que nos devuelve a los temas educativos, en concreto a los programas de intervención para el desarrollo de la empatía, el optimismo, conductas prosociales como el altruismo, tanto en niños como en adolescentes. Today, what I'm going to do is talk to you about the importance of promoting empathy, optimism, and altruism. And I'm also going to talk about recent research findings we now know about how to promote these in schools, as well as some concrete strategies. So I hope that you'll leave today with an idea what you can do on Monday to help promote optimism, compassion, empathy, and altruism in children and adolescents, and maybe for yourself as well. So the big questions are what is social and emotional learning, why is it important, and how can we nurture it in children, how can we promote it? Now, let's look at how much has the idea of social and emotional learning been spreading throughout the world. So first you see where the little red pins are, are the countries that are now taking social and emotional learning as part of education. And you'll see that Spain is in there <laughs> as well, and all other countries. So this idea of, a t of promoting social and emotional learning is part of education for all children, and it's really growing rapidly across the, the globe that researchers now know, and educators, that it's important to educate the heart as well as the mind. And we really have to think about what happens when you have schooling that just focuses on the head and not the heart, and how important it is for that. We also know that one of the missions of school is not just to promote academic achievement, but it's to promote people who are going to be caring members of a society, who are can contribute to become good democratic citizens. Now, what does the research say about how to do this? Well, some of the research says that you can actually teach these competencies. You can teach empathy, you can teach optimism, and you can teach children to be altruistic. And altruism is when you help someone with no expectation of reward. And some of this recent research says that actually we are born good, that babies come into the world to be helpful, to be kind, to be caring. So I'm now going to show you, I hope this works, um, a couple of recent um, uh, findings from a recent study that used toddlers, so babies uh, 18 months old, to see whether in a situation, in an experimental situation, they will help another person that they don't know. This was done by Felix Wernicken and Michael Tomasello. Felix Wernicken is now at Harvard University, but they've been trying to explore what is this idea? Are we born good? And they have a uh, study like this. So I'm going to show you um, some of these, and they don't require any explanation. This is my favorite. Oh. Hmm. Oh. Hmm. What that shows to you here are through a series of experiments that they have done that they show that these little babies, really, will help another person that they don't know. Now think of how the kind of mind a child must have. They have to be able to think about what that other person needs and how they could go about to help that person. And so this is a new research really saying that we, we really can expect these young children to be helpful and caring. Now another study that they've just completed shows that when you give young children a, an extrinsic reward, which means some sort of toy or prize, that you actually decrease their helpfulness. That when you just say, thank you very much, give them praise, that was really helpful to me, or you don't do anything, they continue to be helpful. But that when you give them a prize, they are no longer helpful. Some of the research that I've done in schools, we've asked children in schools, are there any adults at this school who are important to you? 
And what we found is that some children said, no, there's no adults here at this school that are important to me. Then there's children who said, I have one adult, maybe a teacher, maybe the principal or the, or, or the lunch lady. And some children said, I have two adults. And what we found was that those children who said they had no one were lowest on every dimension of social and emotional learning. Those children who had one were higher, but those children who said, there are at least two adults in here in, in my school who are important to me, they were highest on everything. So it says something about how much children feel loved and cared for. And we found the same when we looked at something called pro-social behaviors. They're helping, sharing, and caring, as well as their social responsibility, how much they felt they had a, a role to play. So there are really three components I'm going to talk about here that are essential for social and emotional learning, particularly empathy, compassion, altruism, and optimism. One is an institutional recognition that there has to be leadership that talks about how important this is to the school. Even at the government level, that's what I'll explain to you in, in British Columbia, Canada. There has to be science-based programming, which means what you do must be based on research, that you have to look at the latest research findings. And finally, contributions from the field. You know, we often talk about research informing practice, but I think we sometimes can learn a lot about what happens in schools to inform the research. And often, I argue that we need to listen to children. We need to ask them what they need. Empathy is not only, it's been considered by some to be the most important of all personality characteristics, because it's not just what stops you from behaving aggressively, but empathy is what leads you to help others. So one of the programs in which I've been doing research for the past seven years is a program called The Roots of Empathy. And it's a program, as you can see, uh, newborn babies needed to teach elementary school that actually brings a baby, two to four months old, into the classroom over the course of the school year that children see the baby's development and they get to learn about that baby. But really, what it's about is using the baby as an opportunity to talk about emotion. So the, the Roots of Empathy actually brings an infant and a mother or a caregiver into the classroom over nine months of the school year. Every month, there's a theme that's covered. So they start with meeting the baby, and the children predict how much their baby will be able to do. Um, they talk about temperament. And so the children talk about the baby's temperament, and then then they talk about their own temperament, and then they talk about the temperament of others. So it really changes their perceptions of others. So rather than say, well, Johnny, uh, this little boy is so problematic, he can't sit still, they now say, oh, that's Johnny's temperament. That's how he is. So they change in how they think about other children in their classroom. They learn about crying, and why do babies cry? It's not to irritate their parents. They cry because they need something, and they learn to change their perception of crying. They learn about emotions. They learn about sleep, safety, communication, who am I, and then finally they do goodbye and good wishes. And the last part of the Roots of Empathy each child writes a wish for the baby's life, and they each re read that wish for the baby's life to the baby and his mom or her mom, and then they create a wishing tree that the parent then takes home with them of all the wishes the children have made for the baby's life. So they do a lot of artwork throughout the whole program. So the entire program, children do songs, they do songs for the baby, they read the baby books when the baby comes to visit. So the children are constantly learning about empathy, but in a real situation, rather than say, you know, learn empathy, they actually experience empathy. It's actually quite fascinating how much they just learn to love their babies. They understand that emotions, talking about emotions and emotional literacy is part of the everyday classroom discussions. So the question question is, well, does this program work? And I'm a researcher. I didn't create the Roots of Empathy program. It was created by a woman named Mary Gordon. But I wanted to know, well, does it actually decrease aggression? Does it increase caring for others? And what we found was, this is a graph that shows you, um, for in instance, that this is looking at proactive aggression or something bullying, aggressive acts. 
Over the, this is pre-test and post-test, which is the fall and then the spring after the program has ended. And what you find is across the normal course of the year, this was very surprising to us, children actually increase in aggression. They become more aggressive to each other because at the beginning of the year, they don't know each other very well. But by the end of the year, there's the in-groups and the out-groups and who's cool and who's not that happens. But look at what happens in the Roots of Empathy children. They significantly decrease across the school year in aggression and bullying others. When we looked at things called pro-social behaviors and pro-social characteristics, and this is about caring for others, sharing, kindness, helping others, including people, we found that the Roots of Empathy children who received the program, they significantly increased, whereas the children in the comparison group did not. And in fact, they uh, significantly decreased in terms of the characteristics. So I talk about positive psychology, which is really the study of positive aspects of human experience. And it's not focused on pathology, it's focused on things like optimism, having a very positive outlook on life. And the research really shows that optimistic people, those people who see the glass half full, who wear um, rose-colored glasses, actually are happier, they're healthier, and they live longer. Now, what happens to happiness as children get older, or optimism? Do you know it decreases across the year? So this is fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade. So the age groups would approximately be 9, 10, 11, and 12. And what we find is children become less happy. But the research really shows there are ways to boost children's happiness. When they're connected to others, you know, when I talked before about important adults, that really helps boost happiness. And what we know now is that when you help others, when you, you do random acts of kindness or altruism, you actually promote your own happiness. One of the things that I've been doing the last several years is working with a program called Mind Up that actually uses something called gratitude journals. And having children um, just write down a few times a week the things they have to be grateful for in their life. Now, what we found is we've worked with a whole school district of teachers doing this and having, integrating it into literacy, into language, into writing. Well, soon it became their favorite thing to do, of writing these. And then they found when children were upset about something or angry, they would go and get their gratitude journal and read through it to help them feel better. And then the parents started asking the teachers, well, what are these gratitude journals? And the parents said, now in the morning at the breakfast table, rather than just sort of rush around, that they actually each went around and said, what, what am I going to be grateful for? What's, what am I going to write in my journal? Or what do I have to be grateful for? And children, it's interesting, because when you ask children, you might ask, what are they going to be grateful for? They're going to start talking about all of their electronic devices, their Nintendos, and their toys. And they do start with that, but it quickly shifts to other things. Children who write, I'm really grateful for the beautiful flowers I see on my way to school every morning. I'm really grateful for a friend who helped me. But again, it helps the children. They learn quickly and easily that you can reframe your thinking, that you can change your mind. So one of the things that I'm going to um, show now is an ex uh, something that happened a few years ago in Vancouver about listening to kids uh, what they need for health and happiness. And it was a group of eighth graders. So I think that would be about 13 and 14-year-old children. And what they did is they um, decided to do um, an experiment. And they call themselves the Breakfast Club. I'm not sure why they called themselves. They didn't want to have anybody know who they were. It was all anonymous because they felt that altruism is when you expect nothing in return and that they didn't want anyone to know who they were. This school in Coquitlam, it was a middle school, had encountered numerous problems. It was in a lower economic area, as well as had been characterized as a school in which there was a lot of bullying occurring, a lot of aggression. So they were encountering on a daily basis adversity in their life, both in their neighborhoods as well as in the school community. The class came up with the idea of doing random acts of kindness for the staff at the school. The students got to work, complimenting teachers, holding doors, and the teachers were quick to express their gratitude kids said, you know what, we didn't want to do this to get thanked, so maybe we should make an anonymous club and call ourselves a breakfast club and secretly do stuff. 
First came anonymous thank you notes for all of the staff, not just the teachers. The local newspaper got a hold of this story and articles started appearing. The community was aware of this. More donations started coming in. Somebody donated a Christmas tree for the breakfast club to decorate for the staff, which was amazing. What really, really illustrates is the dynamic nature of resiliency. Resilience is not static. It's not within the child or it's not something in the environment that just sprinkles on nutrients to them, but it's really about the dynamic interplay. And think about how this, this one instance changed the whole perception of a community. Um, really about how they perceived what our 8th graders like. Now instead of 8th graders being the kids who we can't let in our store because they're going to for sure steal something, they're now, oh, those are kids that might be part of the breakfast club. Those kids who've been doing all that nice, you know, wonderful giving things for others. At one point we had the entire school doing random acts of kindness for the entire school. They had better relationships with the teachers in the school, with the secretaries, with the custodian, but they also had better relationships amongst each other. But then I also asked them, what about your relationship with your parents? What was the, what, what happened there? And one girl, I remember her telling me, she goes, you know, I'm just happier, I feel better, I go home, I don't fight with my parents as much. Uh, as I did before. After this happened and the school revealed, the kids revealed themselves, now think about how brave and courageous they were to stand up there. Because sometimes when you're in eighth grade, it's not too cool to be someone who's really good, right? You know, kids at that age, they're sort of moving away and they stood up and the school rallied. The children in the school, the rest of the students, actually secretly collected money so that this whole kid, all the kids from the breakfast club, that one classroom, could go to an adventure park and take them. And then the children from the breakfast club actually did a, to thank for the food drive, they actually had a hot dog and um, a barbecue for the entire school to thank them. So it was, it just, uh, it got out of control, all the giving and helping and kindness. So to end, I just want to go back to this notion is what is our what, what should we do for as a, as a whole world? And that the true measure of a nation's standing is how well it attends to its children, their health and safety, their material security, their sense of being loved, valued, and included in the families and societies in which they were born. So I'm just um, have you go forward and think about two things. One is how you can promote your own happiness because I think it really starts with the adults and what we do, you know, maybe start a gratitude journal, maybe start at doing random acts of kindness or helping. And then the other thing is, is that what now can you do with the children in your life? Um, all of us in society, even if you don't work directly with children, we all play an important role because they are the future. They are the ones who will take over the world from us. And I think now with all the things that are happening in our society, with technology, that we really more than ever really need to attend to this idea of empathy, altruism, and optimism. Gracias. <laughs>